All right, let's get started. I have a ton of material here. So let's start from the beginning. What is software architecture? Well, my experience is that if you ask, if you ask 50 developers, you're gonna get 50 answers. Uh, everyone disagrees on this and everyone agrees about some parts. I asked ChatGPT, it's, uh, I believe the answer is, I agree with it, but it's, it's very dry. You can, you can ask ChatGPT yourself. I'm not gonna do that for you. All right, uh, so historically what we call architecture has changed a lot. In, uh, before the year 2000, it was all about drawing uh, flow charts and state machines. Uh, I, I was made to do this actually in, uh, I don't know, you would call it college probably? Swedish school system works differently. Um, 1990 to 2005, uh, I was already working back then. Uh, you would draw up this gigantic UML diagram, class diagrams. The, there was a competing model, not so popular, called OMT, but that's not important. Also, database uh, designs used to take up entire walls because for some reason people would print it and put it on the wall and every property was listed. This maybe was more designed for a waterfall era. Um, 2000, 2010, I would say that general architecture as models started to appear, uh, often as PhD thesis from uh, interesting enough from people who never worked in software development. They went and did their master's degree, then they did their PhD, and they invented a new way of architecting. It's nothing happened to like 98% of this. And uh, where we are today is usually feature by feature architect on demand. And we have some general uh, description of a system. Maybe it would be more interesting to bring up what I consider to be architecture. I simplify it and say it's a description of a system or a system feature. Uh, or you could also say it's a set of rules that defines different characteristics, priorities, and constraints of a system. Uh, there are common elements for a system architecture that we always look at. Same thing here. I will be publishing these slides afterwards and you can look them up online. Uh, there will be differences of opinion what to include and what to exclude here as well. All right, even more interesting question. What is great software architecture? For me, it's, uh, it depends on how easy it is to describe the architecture of a system. And I worked at very, I'm sure I worked for more than 20 companies. The fastest places I learned the architecture of a system and can become productive in two, three days. Uh, and a few places, it's taken, it's taken me six months. Uh, and there's always a commonality here. Uh, if we have clear rules of how the system is defined, how we send messages, uh, how we handle errors, how we do observability and so on, uh, it's very easy to get started because it will be done everywhere the same everywhere. If people got very creative, that means there are a lot of exceptions, and exceptions really, really slows me down from learning a system. If there are 20 rules and 20,000 exceptions, then I really have to learn all those exceptions as well. Because in this module, we don't use that logger, and uh, in this part of the system, we are using REST, and in that part of the system, we are using GraphQL, and in a third part, we may be using Kafka or something like that for sending messages. Uh, and I believe that good, great architecture should assist development. It should not hinder. So it should, uh, it should be of help. It shouldn't be an obstacle. The pure architect as a separate role fallacy, I call it. It's, uh, I, I'm guessing, I don't know exactly where this came from. I'm guessing you look at other industries and say, hey, 
when we build something like a skyscraper, there is an architect and then there is the construction workers. Software should, be, should work exactly the same, right? Uh, only that this is not true because in, uh, when we are building buildings, architecting and construction work are two very separate skill sets. Uh, I only believe that you are a good software architect if you are still actively writing code. Uh, don't want to shame any of my previous employer, but there's a certain bank here in Singapore where uh, the architecture team or solution engineering team of 50 people haven't been writing code for 5 to 20 years each. They, they draw boxes with lines between them, and when you ask them what that line represents, they, they are not really sure. Uh, as you well know, I'm not writing code on a day-to-day -day basis anymore, so I often take myself out of, uh, of being the architect of what we are doing. I, I still have an opinion. 25 years, 30 years behind the keyboard uh, when it comes to policy and big picture, and especially as architecture will always impla impact what I'm doing as well, hiring strategy. I will not allow an architecture with 10 programming languages or some rare programming language like uh, saying we are going to do everything in uh, Python and Django, for example. Uh, it's going to be too hard for me to hire, and it's a matter of cost as well, sometimes. Uh, right, so on that level I get involved. So, who is it that should architect? I already touched on that on the previous screen. I think that everyone that writes code should architect. So, who is it that should architect? I already touched on that on the previous screen. I think that everyone that writes code should architect. Uh, if you are contributing to the system, when you are developing a bigger feature, you should be architecting that, uh, not to degrade the system quality. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a meritocracy, meaning that we go with the best ideas, but it's definitely not a democracy. The, I mean, there are a lot of smart people here in front of me. Uh, but uh, if we are building a system, Yusin is a great architect, I am a great architect, but trying to merge our ideas of how we are going to build something, uh, if we are doing it fairly, will end up in disaster. I would rather set myself subservient and say, you have the final word. Doesn't matter seniority. It just needs to be someone has the complete picture in their head. Uh, and of course, we differ between system architecture and feature architecture. Uh, system architecture, we decide, we set, we can change it. That will always come with a cost. Feature architecture, we do all the time. Anyone is free to pick that task up. I think we should have them as Jira tasks, actually. Uh, and a good architect can explain his or her idea to others and get a buy-in from all others developers before we get started. Here is where it comes, this skill, learning to talk in front of people. It didn't come naturally to me. Uh, uh, I mean, it's natural to be introvert when it comes to being a developer, but the difference is really here. Do I want to sit for the next three years and implement someone else's, uh, else's shitty architecture? Or do I want to make someone else implement my shitty architecture? Uh, so, and also this is true. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So about six, seven years of my career, I've been teaching at universities. One of the reasons was to become a better speaker, uh, to be able to present ideas in a more coherent manner. But I also learned something very important here. A lot of concepts I thought I understood. Once you get a flurry of questions, I wasn't that sure of it. And often I overcomplicated the lectures in that area if I didn't understand it perfectly. So same thing with architecture. Keep it simple, present it in simple terms. Uh, no need to dig into every property and attribute. Just get the buy-in for people. If you can get a buy-in from two people, then 10 people, then 50 people, and so on. That's how you do it. Uh, when do we architect? All the time. 
as uh, soon as a new feature is being built, you are free to pick it up and help architect. Some of you are better at it than others, uh, but hey, it's just a skill. Anyone can learn and anyone can contribute. Um, but please don't describe on paper what can be des described in code. We don't architect a feature that uh, takes 50 lines of code. Uh, we only do it when necessary. We architect for developers. Uh, and yes, we need system architecture for common concerns. It can't be that you say, this is the way I like to do it, so I'm going to do it my way. Uh, it's sort of an ambition or manifesto rather than a description of the system. It works as both. Uh, and the features, yes, when we need abstraction, uh, the needs for separation of concerns, uh, testability, maintainability, extendability, or performance, or whatever. Uh, and for the system not to degrade over time. What is important when architecting? The KISS rule always applies. Uh, for those who don't know, it stands for keep it simple, stupid. Uh, separation of concerns. The, for example, the logger shouldn't do any business logic. The network or transport layer of messages shouldn't do any, uh, any higher level uh, logic and so on. I, I was opposed to REST for a long time because we actually do application error messages in the network layer, which I, I, it's breaking the rules here, but separation of concerns, if you can mod modular, modularize the system, it will be easier to work with. Uh, try to map what we are doing to the physical world. Uh, don't build artificial Rube Goldberg machines. Uh, a Rube Goldberg machine is, uh, well, you can look it up, it's simply, so those kind of machines where you know you have a ball spiraling and hitting a pad and uh, something else drops and uh, spins and so on. It's very easy to start, ar start architecting artificial entities. We're going to get back to that when we talk about domain-driven design. Uh, create or follow priorities and uh, uh, try to describe an abstraction level that steps takes two or three steps into the future. Uh, okay, we don't have time to build observability in this uh, sprint, but we are gonna do it in the next, for example, so there need to be a way to do that. Where do I plug in my logger? Now, I, I, I think observability should be built right off the start, but it's an example. And uh, also, if you have to work around architecture, do I have a good example here? Our admin UI, for example. Uh, authorization has to do for, be done for each endpoint because it wasn't built in from the beginning. No, no finger pointing. So, what are the common patterns in architecture? Well, we can start looking at some common debates that's been going on for a few years now. Uh, we have the classic one for microservices versus monolith. Um, in the dawn of my career, everything was a monolith. Nothing wrong with that. Um, then, 10, 15 years ago or so, uh, microservices started to become popular and everyone was supposed to do microservices all, the, uh, all of a sudden for every system they built. Uh, and there were some common arguments here. Why do we do microservices? Uh, uh, people were saying things like, oh, but we can choose a new programming language for every service that we write. Well, in theory we can, but that also means I need to keep 20 people here over, over holidays, because uh, if we're gonna maintain a system with 10 languages, then, then I'm gonna have someone representing each language. Uh, and there are other things, uh, I keep hearing like, oh, we are too many developers. If we have more repositories, then, uh, uh, then we won't stumble and have to rebase as often. Well, Git was written for being thousands and tens of thousands of people in the same repository. So that's uh, not knowing how to rebase in Git is not really a good 
reason for doing microservices. I, I do believe it, there are the, the true use cases for microservices is when you have certain endpoints, certain parts of your business logic that consumes a lot of CPU or memory, so it doesn't scale together with the other parts of the, uh, of the system and so on. You want to scale it individually. Netflix is an example. The, I think they are running 700 or 800 instances of the services that are actually serving the video stream. But for the browsing, you only need like 10 instances maybe. And it's totally different data. Uh, often with microservices, I found that we are exchanging one problem for another. Uh, the complexity of infrastructure goes up enormously when we are start doing microservices. And it's, uh, uh, instead of needing three DevOps people, we need uh, 15 of them. And the cost of having a dev environment, staging environment, prod environment, and testing environment also goes up because uh, we, yes, all of a sudden, instead of having 20 EC2 instances, we need 300. Uh, but, I mean, the way I see it these days, I think there's more of a gray zone. It doesn't have to be either or. Everyone thinks of, uh, when they say monolith, everyone thinks of Java and uh, deploying the old war files with FTP and so on. It's uh, where you're running one instance and if you wanted to go faster or scale, you, you buy more hardware. Doesn't have to be that at all. Let's get back to that. First, I want to do an example here of, uh, of uh, something I architected a long time ago in the microservice world. Uh, and here's an example of, of, uh, of me and architecture. So, uh, yes, okay, I missed the slide. That's coming later. So, okay, microservices rules and patterns. Uh, single service ownership of data sources. Man, I was breaking that all the time in the beginning. I didn't understand why it was needed. But if you think about it, if you put a filter on some data, um, it's really good to have that in one service. Otherwise, you have to put it in a library and implement it in five services. Also, there are a lot of race conditions and deadlocks by if you have multiple services reading from the same table. Uh, dynamic endpoint routing. Uh, yes, this became necessary because we, you don't want the client to have the logic of where, what each service is deployed to, what container and so on. So you put a proxy there uh, and it looks like all the endpoints are on one entity and it will, there's a lot of advantages to doing this as well. You can have uh, backup solutions and so on. One endpoint is not responding in my local cluster. So I have endpoints in another cluster somewhere or a backup service. Uh, Single concern reusable services. Uh, yes, this is a case actually for doing microservices. You have a weather service, you have an authorization service. Uh, Google have a lot of this uh, where they have one service serving the whole company, for example. Uh, yeah. Scaling groups. Uh, as I said before, the old monolithic uh, uh, JBoss war file thing, uh, only scalability you got was buying more hardware. With microservices, this thing about scaling groups, so you run, you scale horizontally, you run several instances, much cheaper, much better, can scale to almost infinity. Uh, although, I discovered, why can't you do this with a monolith? Uh, and of course, the deployment versioning strategy. This is what I'm coming to soon. This is, I don't know, nine out of 10 are doing it wrong. No one, I never seen anyone do it really right. Uh, and again, some problems were solved 20 years ago with a monolith, you do microservices, they come back. How do you coordinate a series of calls to happen in a certain order? You need to collect data, you need things to happen in an atomic way. And there are several ways of solving it. The most common one would be saga patterns. And I could stand here talk all day about all kinds of strange patterns like uh, 
sidecar pattern and so on, where your, your service run in a high level language and uh, doing some cryptography like uh, Bitcoin mining, it runs that in a, something written in C or C++, it's a one-to-one -one and yeah, well, let's not get into that too much. All right, so let's do two examples here when it comes to how you version microservices. And actually, yes, this is an example with microservices, but it can as easily be done with a monolithic structure as well. Uh, so let's look at the wrong way first. Let's say we have a microservice mesh that looks like this. It's not an unusual sight to see. You have clients on the left side in orange, you have the services in red, and you have your databases or data sources in black. Uh, services consume services. So rather, when we are speaking here, rather than speaking about the clients and services, I am going to talk about uh, 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 consumers and producers of data instead. That's more fair because one service here, service uh, C, yes, it serves the clients, but it's, uh, it's also um, uh, consuming service B and service D. All right. So let's start looking at the wrong way and why this is the wrong way. Uh, this is super common when you are deploying. So let's say we, we need to update one of the services here. Uh, and this is the setup I see in most places. We are gonna update service F here. We rip out the deployed instance and we deploy the new instance there. And the problem is not making it work. We can do that in a staging environment. The problem here is usually testing because if you deploy a new service, then uh, the, even if the a API is identical, the behavior might change from uh, all consuming services. So this problem grows. Uh, I not only have to test service F, I have to test service D, G, and I as well, because they are consuming service F. And anyone that's consuming them and anyone that's consuming them, them and so on. That's why uh, uh, we call it the spaghetti monolith. Uh, because essentially what happens is that you are never deploying one service. You are deploying, redeploying all your services every release. Uh, another bank I work for spends 24 hours on a weekend shutting down their system deploying their 300 services. So how do you do it right? Uh, well, there is a right way of doing it. Uh, a friend of mine, we started looking at this 13, 15 years ago. How do the big boys do it? How do Google do it? How do Meta do it and so on, Facebook? Uh, and we draw our own conclusion and so on. And uh, the way to do it here is that old versions of services are immutable and keeps running until they are no longer consumed. So, meaning I have version one running and when I deploy version two, I don't remove version one from production. Anyone consuming version one can still live uh, and we have not broken any contract. Uh, consumers of data, consumers of an API should know which vers version they want to consume. The, the service itself, the producer of something, should be agnostic. Anyone can call. Uh, and yes, there's going to be uh, pushback on this because the complexity of DevOps goes up slightly. Uh, the cost is going to go up as well uh, because we are running more instances. If I'm, if I'm running three versions of every service, then uh, of course, we're gonna suck up more EC2 containers and so on. Uh, but what we gain here is gonna be an independent life cycle for services. You will see how I can deploy new services and data sources and even clients' versions into production without uh, 
disturbing anything that goes on. I can even do testing in production. Uh, so let's have a look at it. Same service mesh as before. Uh, and yes, I, I, I do have a purple cloud. And my services are here. So we're gonna do this step for step. What's changed from the other version uh, I showed on this one is that you can see there is a small version number attached to each service right now. And to make it simple, everything is deployed in version one right now. So I'm just gonna do uh, integer versions, version one, version two in this. So let's look at a few scenarios. This is our production environment right now. Um, someone has developed a new service they want to deploy into production. It's not replacing anything. Uh, and it's relatively risk-free. We are introducing service H here uh, with a new data source. It's only consuming service C, so the test mesh for this is minimal. We deploy it to production, and then Niloy and Krishnal can spend a month testing the hell out of it in production if they want. Uh, yes, and the same, of course, if we deploy a new version of an existing service. Uh, service A got the version two here. We leave version one untouched, running in production. This is gonna put some, I know what you're thinking already, this puts some constraints on the database updates, right? And that is true. Uh, database changes become more rigid and slow here because you can add columns, you can add fields, but you can't really remove anything until uh, um, if uh, we deprecate a column, it's gonna take a lot of versions before we can remove it. But okay, we deployed a new service, service A, we can test that in production. We uh, deploy service D, that's consuming the new version two of service A and version one of service H. Uh, also, we also, we only have to test that. Nothing is disturbed. Uh, we can curl it and so on. Nothing is going to happen to the existing services. This is, by the way, not gonna be interesting until we get to step 11 or so. Then you're gonna see the, the use of it. Uh, we release a new version of the mobile app, version two, that's actually consuming the new service D here. Uh, and you can see the, the old version is consuming version one. The, new version of the app is consuming version two of that service. Uh, we introduce more services. Service B gets another one. Service E gets another version. Uh, and when we release the mobile app, uh, version three, yes, I'm really having three consecutive versions here. Uh, why would I want to do something like that? Well. Customers, users don't really like to upgrade if we release a new app. I know we do code push, so they don't have to uh, download anything from the App Store and Google Play Store. Singapore is super fast doing code push. If you, uh, if you live in another country where you're on a 3G or 2G connection, maybe not so interesting to take that uh, update all the time. But okay, three versions in production. The cycle goes like this. I should deprecate the oldest one. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm deprecating the, the oldest version. Uh, and uh, I introduce a new version of the mobile app. Uh, I, again, deprecate the oldest version of the mobile app. And now, something interesting has happened here. Some of the services, if you can see that, are no longer being consumed by anyone actually. Uh, for example, service E here is completely without consumers. And we can see that in the DevOps dashboard. So now we can deprecate that permanently. Boom, we take it away. You're with me so far? Uh, and we didn't disturb anything. Uh, this is continuous deployment, continuous integration at its very best. Now service D has no one consuming it, so we can remove that too. Uh, service 
A version one has no consumers. Oh, sorry, service B first. Don't know my slides well enough. Uh, and then of course, service A would be the last one. So now you can see we have gone full cycle in, in, uh, in upgrading. Yes, it looks like uh, a lot more complicated, but it's actually easier because the backend can develop at their own pace. Some of the services uh, versions they deploy will never be consumed. And the client can simply, when the mobile app can say, hey, we are gonna take these versions and consume. Uh, whatever is deployed in production right now. So you gain these disconnect independent cycles uh, in theory. In reality, you probably want to release a feature every now and then. But it may have existed on the back end a month before the, the front end even gets to it. All right, so this is an example I, uh, uh, of architecting as well. And I wanted to show on uh, microservices, how to really do versioning. Uh, I did this at DBS Bank and nobody got my point. Why would we do this? Uh, and they have like 3000 microservices running. It's gonna cost a fortune, it's gonna be, it's meaningless and so on. Uh, but remember what I was talking about before, about selling your features to someone. So I got one person aboard, uh, Jays. Uh, it's an Australian guy, a uh, little bit weird, but uh, he helped me, he really got it. He helped me argue for this. All of a sudden we got 10 people aboard and then we got 50 people aboard with it and eventually, okay, let's try it. So uh, we tried it out and now the whole bank is doing this actually. Uh, one of, I count that as a, as a me achievement, uh, even though it was a whole team and probably the DevOps people worked much harder than me on it. I, I did a fancy presentation. All right, let's go back to this. So we were talking before about uh, uh, the monolith and so on. And what we are doing here at, uh, in Cake Engineering is what I would call the horizontally scalable monolith. Because the classic monolith couldn't be scaled in this manner but you put this behind a scaling group as a microservice, you can run multiple instances and we can handle more traffic and so on. And uh, it's actually quite amazing. Uh, when I interviewed with Yusin, I was quite tired. I, I, uh, I didn't do my research before it. Uh, and I, I just gave him, bam, this is how I did it when I worked for B Mobility. I, 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 I would write the whole stack in, in uh, in TypeScript, uh, React Native, React JS, and we do Node.js on the back end. Uh, didn't have time to do microservices, didn't seem worthwhile, so we are doing a monolith instead and so on. And, uh, and Yusin actually accused me of spying on him secretly or studying up or something like that, because that's exactly how we have done it here as well. What can I say? Great minds think alike. <laughs> no, it's... Uh, so the horizontally scalable monolith, I mean, simple deployments, reduced costs, scales like a microservice, and nothing says we, it has to be codependent. We can still modularize it, divide it into folders, have no dependencies in between, thin interfaces. The advantage of that architecture is that when we have a billion users, we are probably gonna need microservices and then we can easily rip, rip it apart and create individual services of it. I'm hoping we will have a billion users. It's up to marketing, uh, no pressure. Let's talk about and mention a couple of other uh, paradigms as well when it comes to architecting. Uh, how many here has heard the words domain-driven design? It's, uh, it's often asked for on JDs and uh, job descriptions and so on. Uh, and I, I remember it started as a blog article of uh, 50 lines of someone who was really, really tired of, uh, of people creating these monsters where they had uh, uh, factories and thread pool uh, monsters and 
inheritance in seven steps and said, what if we just write systems that actually maps onto reality? Uh, so if we are doing uh, uh, a, a crypto, we're implementing a crypto site, we have something that's uh, an entity that uh, simulates the wallet. Uh, we have something for payments. We have something, uh, it maps to reality one-to-one. -one. This is what domain-driven design is. Uh, don't build big artificial constructs. Keep it to uh, keep it as real as possible. And yes, that little blog article that I read from the beginning, it came out as a, uh, as a book of 100 pages, and then it became a book of 250 pages, and then it became a book of 600 pages. Some ideas should just be kept simple, I think. You're most welcome to read it. I believe it's, uh, you can download the PDF for free from uh, InfoQ. Uh, but uh, yeah, whenever they ask for this on the job description, keep it simple. Another architecture that I really like to work with uh, unfortunately, it doesn't scale to infinity, but it's uh, super nice to work with. I, I am ridiculously fond of something called the pub-sub pattern. You have entities in the system who publishes a service or messages, and anyone can choose to subscribe or consume these messages. Uh, and you can build your entire architecture like this. Uh, um, so imagine that every significant event that every service receives uh, got a request for uh, data, responding with this message, create user and so on. Every time that happens, we, we publish a message on an, what we call an event bus or an event plane. Uh, usually in reality, this is realized by uh, let's say a Kafka queue or a Solus queue or SQS, if you don't care about performance at all and, uh, and so on. You, you can impl the implementation is not important. Uh, a stream of messages where everyone can reach them. And any other entity can listen to these messages. Uh, we'll go to the next slide to show you how that would look like. Uh, and uh, the advantage is, of course, the producer here is not dependent on the listener. The listener is a passive consumer. Uh, the listener cares that the producer is there, but probably has some error handling if it's not. Uh, and data is usually handled in a separate data plane in, uh, in an event-driven system. So, I mean, it started out, you can send your PII and data out on the event plane. This is not a good way of doing it. By writing it directly to a data source when the request comes in, publishing the messages, you can make sure that that emailing or SMS agent that's subscribing to these messages has to authorize, it, authorize itself and say, hey, I have the right to get these messages. Uh, so as a producer, you don't have to care about it. You write it to the database or the data plane and that's the end of it. Uh, it's a very robust and secure pattern, but of course there are limitations on performance and resource management. Imagine yourself, when this goes up to, it's fine for 20 services, but each subscriber has to read every message saying, this message not for me, this message not for me, this message not for me, and maybe one message in 10,000 really is for me, and, uh, but I still have to do something every time a message comes in. And if I have tens of thousands of producers, that's gonna be really he heavy because all of a sudden I'm having scaling groups just to, to handle meaningless messages that I'm not interested in. Yes, a logger is gonna be interested in every message, uh, but the emailer is gonna, only gonna be interested in uh, password reset, uh, user creation and so on. All the other requests, like look in my crypto wallet, is not going to be interesting, so we throw that away. All right. 
how does this look like in, uh, in reality? Well, you have a service or a producer of data and you have an event plane. Let's say it's a Kafka queue this time. Uh, on this, we want to add uh, the data plane as well. Uh, and as I said, usually this is used with microservices, which means that the data plane here would be one service for each data source. Uh, last company me and Peter worked for actually auto-generated the data plane. Uh, so a lot of magic happening there. I, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, you will see, see here. This is just to exemplify. But okay, now I have this. This system is running. Uh, it can answer messages. Uh, let's say I want to introduce something like uh, an emailer I mentioned before. So the service producer, the little gray blob in the left corner would get a request. Uh, for a user to be created. It writes that user data into the data plane. It's stored in one of the databases. It publishes a message on the event plane. Uh, the email consumer service here picks up, aha, user was created. I should email a welcome message. So it goes in, it has an ID from that message. It asks the database, can I have all the user data for this ID? Sure, you're allowed to. So it gets the data, it creates the email, and it sends it. Uh, it's not really concerned. This is a very suitable architecture for something like this. An email being sent, for example, it uh, uh, it's doesn't have to respond immediately. It fails a little bit. Uh, it's not as fast as a REST call or a Kafka call when it comes to uh, request response messages, get me this data now and present it. You can make it as fast by having caching schemes and or sending the data in the event plane or doing some sort of hybrid where the service also has a REST interface so you can send data directly. Uh, yeah. Uh, and of course, I can have an infinite amount of listeners to this. Uh, Logger is the classic example. All of a sudden, observability becomes a dream. Uh, you just hook on a logger to the event plane and say, throw all my stuff into uh, whatever logging service we want it to be, Datadog, Splunk, uh, uh, Elk Stack, and so on. And we can redirect it and we can have multiple listeners here. Right. Yes, this was actually all of it. Uh, and I know it was a race of slides, but uh, I'm gonna publish all of it. I wanted to give a little bit of time for questions and discussion.